We currently live in a little, um, it's like a 400 yeah. square foot tiny home. So oh. it's a small. You're living in a tiny home. We're living in a tiny home. Wait, now you can't hear me complain then because you're in a tiny home with three kids under five? Three kids, yeah, five and under, yeah. All right. Yeah. How's that going? You know, we are, we're content. We're comfortable. It's, there's different stages of tiny home, right? So you have the tiny home that's on a trailer mm -hmm. that people drive around. Um, ours is not on a trailer. It's on skids. So it's a little wider. It's like 14 feet wide by, and it, it's just enough that when you come into it, it feels more open. Okay. You go into a regular tiny home. It's, it's almost like a hallway, right? It's, mm. it's just very narrow. Um, so, um, in many ways, we're quite quite comfortable. Couch folds down. Boys sleep out there. Everest, our our daughter is still pretty young, little crib by our bed, mm -hmm. um, and so it's nice. But we're we're ready to move on. Why did to, you do that? To a larger space. We did it primarily just financially wise. We don't oh. want to don't want to go into a bunch of debt. Yeah. So how much does it cost to live in a tiny home like that every month? Gotta ask my wife. <laughs> she takes care it's of It's paid our, for? She takes care of our home place. Yeah. So it's paid for. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's the land. regular electric and we have spring water, so we don't. And you're on family land, right? We are. And it's paid for. Yeah. Yeah. Grandpa bought this 75 acres in 1932 for $500. 500 bucks. Yeah. That's incredible. So we were paid, we, we, it's paid for. <laughs> no, and then my dad bought, had bought it, buy, bought it from them for 20000 in the 50s. Yeah. And then I bought it from my dad for half a million Okay. in the 10s. It increased in value significantly. <laughs> <laughs> and he was giving me a good deal. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, so back to the tiny home thing. So, yeah. and, and your business. You run a business called Seed Time. For those that don't know, that's a garden planning business. Also, though, you're a manufacturer. Well, this is what I, like I'll, you're looking at our in, coffee mug and you're like, I made this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll put that as a past project. Now we don't do it anymore. Why not? Um, Seems like we ran you into made a coffee mug that ended up being in my place. We bought it at Walmart or Amazon somewhere. Amazon. Wouldn't, wouldn't there be a lot of money in that? There is. There is significant money in it. They're quite hot selling items. Um, and we just ran into manufacturing issues was the main thing. So mm. we had it managed. So I'm not a manufacturer, but we had it manufactured and then you uh. become a manufacturer when you, <laughs> you had the but, patent. Um, no, we don't have a patent on it, but uh, we did, okay. we did redesign the lid so that it would be completely plastic free on the inside. Um, which is very rare for an electric that's right. kettle. I'm going to tell you right now, that's why we have it. Probably. Yeah. She's the crazy stainless steel lady. <laughs> yeah. And I'm down. And that's what we and sold it as. I mean, we still inside. You know, all the Amazon keywords was you know plastic free kettle. So is that some passive income for you now, or did you sell that business? No, we just it's pretty much it's not officially shut down yet, but we are going to be officially. So that coffee down. mug is going away. Yeah. Sorry. Really? <laughs> Sorry. Everything Maybe she we likes can re and re gets re into resurrect it and finds and enjoys then goes away. Seems how it goes. Well, hopefully not every. How many were you selling a month? Uh, it was. Uh, I mean, we were doing a couple hundred. Couple hundred a month. I mean, it slowed down like over time because we ended up. Here, here's the thing: we it was a side business project, and we put a bunch of time into it, getting it off the off the ground and started, um, and then. Seed time took off, and we like I'm I'm swamped with seed time, so I can't you know I yeah. can't focus on anything else really, and um, so it ended up just being a a side thing, and it just sat and ran on its own for for a while, and then um, it never took off to the scale that we really got our investment back in it, and that you know we oh, could yeah. really push it forward and stuff because we ended up spending quite a bit of money in the actual redesign process. Mm. Um, they have to redo molds and stuff like that for it. So, uh, anyways, so you actually, I think there's still potential. Yeah, I, I think there's still potential there. Um, but it just are you guys just a bunch of entrepreneurs? 
Interestingly enough, uh, our family has shifted to the entrepreneurial world. Interesting enough, they weren't. So they weren't, yeah. So my grandfather on both sides of my family, my mom's side and my dad's side, um, both of my grandfathers were doctors hmm. and deep in the medical field. Uh, my dad has a master's in public health, um, both of my parents actually, and my my uncle who eventually started the farm, he was a teacher. Um, so more just regular standard careers. Uh, now, my da- interestingly, my dad did get an agriculture degree in college, like an associates or something like that. So he, like, he's always been interested in agriculture. Um, and then he went and most of his career was in public health. So we actually, I grew up a lot overseas and he was doing public health clinics and um, working with uh, local communities overseas. And then it wasn't until I turned 11 that we actually came back to the United States and eventually landed back on the farm. My uncle started the farm. He eventually invited my dad to come join him. And that's it was a deep dive into agriculture. And there's tons of stories. I mean... We learned the hard way. So you've been farming your whole life. I have not been farming my whole life, but my uh, we always had a garden. So my mom was uh, my dad got the agriculture associate's degree. My mom was the green thumb of the family, and so like so much so that anywhere we would go, she would be the one that was bringing plant cuttings with her. When we moved, we were taking our compost, you know. Uh, with us and so we always everywhere we went where there was always a garden we always had stuff um, that we were growing and when we moved back to the states my dad put up a greenhouse you know we were um, it it was always a part of our lives Hmm. but then when we moved to the farm that's when it actually became like a part our livelihood right and that takes it to a new level and you have to learn new skills and um and yeah, like I said, you learn a lot of things the hard way. It actually became your livelihood. That that was the income. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was not a doctor anymore. Yeah. He gave up the doctor to be a Well, farmer. so my grandfather was the doctor. Oh, that's My dad right. was the public health, master's okay. in public okay. health. Okay, I get you. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, so he stopped. He did a couple, like, consultancy jobs um, here and there, and then that eventually phased out and just went full-time into, into small-scale vegetable farming. Um, it would have vet- vegetables, herbs, and berries. Yeah. Yeah. What countries did you live in? Yeah. So I was born in Sudan, and then um, we moved and lived in Tanzania for several years. And then what I remember the most was actually Yemen, which is wow. in the Middle East. Um, what, so. uh, did you say why you were moving, why you were so international? So my dad and mom... We're doing public health work over there. Okay. And we're also there um, for missional purposes as well. Um, although most of the countries, both Sudan and Yemen, like you cannot be there mm-hmm. for any type of, with any type okay. of missional aspect. Um, you, you know, you're there for, for work, for business. And so um, he was there as a public health, um, going out to remote villages, helping with um, sanitation, like teaching about sanitation, and um, they had a clinic and, and all that kind of stuff. So where are you from? That's a good question. <laughs> I, you travelers, I, I ask that. You don't have a sense of home. There was a, I, I came back into the United States one time after traveling overseas, and the customs dude looked at me, and he's like, you're Sudanese. And I was like, well... I mean, I was born in Sudan. He's like, passports don't lie. You're Sudanese. Because <laughs> obviously I was born You there. were a Sudanese um, citizen. I was not, no. So I, it, it would be kind of fun to say that I was, but no, I can't, I can't say that I was. Uh, at the time, and I don't know if it's changed now, but at the time your grandfather had to be a citizen mm. for you to be like automatically. Okay. So. It's not like America. Were you born yeah. here, you're American. Yeah. So I had to go back a while. But why do you remember Yemen then? Yeah, so those were the years uh, when 
I was between about five to 11. So um, I remember a little bit okay. of Tanzania, which was right before that, but that, mm -hmm. I was just so young that it wasn't um, as what much. What language do they speak there? Arabic. You speak that? I mean, shoya, shoya. Wow. It's a little bit. I, bet, okay. I would have thought you said, yeah, sure. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> no. Only a little bit. No, I've lost. Show you, show you. Have you <laughs> ever pulled that off somewhere? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. You know, I bet I'll you see. surprise the crud out of somebody. <laughs> yeah, I'll see so, like an Arab and I'll say, Salam alaikum. You know, it's, it's their wow. welcome, their welcome or greeting. Yeah. And, they, and they're so surprised. And yeah, sometimes. It's not like us knowing a little bit of Spanish. That's one thing. Right, yeah. It's not a way less common, yeah, for an, uh, for a so, American to know a little bit of Arabic. But, but your heart language is English. It is, yeah. You pray in English? Yeah. Yeah. But you don't know where home is. Well, home is Tennessee now, yeah. It is. So, <clears throat> and uh, I would say... I mean, in in a couple aspects. One, it's the longest. It's the place that I've lived the longest now. Okay. Uh, for sure, um, and and we the our history here in Tennessee does go back. My grandfather was born in Bonacqua, which isn't very far from the farm where we live now. So he actually grew up in Tennessee, um, and then uh. he spent his career in Southern California, and then moved back and retired here. And so. Um, the family kind of has centered back to your family their roots. roots are in Tennessee. Yeah. Why why Tennessee? Why do you think your family chose Tennessee over all the other 49 states? Good question. So it actually goes back to a family history where early on uh, my grandfather's parents and I don't remember if it was their parents as well, if it was just my grandfather's parents. I think it was my grandfather's parents that moved to Tennessee. And they moved mm. because they wanted to do mission work in mm. Tennessee. They wanted to start a church, and um, they did. Eventually, the family ended up starting a church. It's the one we go to now, actually. What? Uh, in Tennessee, Centerville, Tennessee. That's been over 100 years ago. Yeah, it's been... Uh, what been mission work time. is this? A seven day Adventist mission work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have a long history of farming or gardening. Gardening. You have a long mm -hmm. history of Seventh day Adventist. Yeah. So much so mm -hmm. that you were on missions with it with your folks. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. And they're not still doing that. Yeah, not in the same way. Yeah. Although they still are involved with um, an organization right now actually called Farm Stew. Okay. And what it does is it's primarily works in Africa, but it has um, it works in other locations as well. And they're actually wanting to do it here in the United States as well. But what they do is they go into a community and they teach the local people how to farm, mm -hmm. how to eat healthfully. Um, a lot of the same oh. development style work that my dad used to do, but really um, empowering the local people at at the local level. Um, so instead of just coming in and, and doing programs, it's really um, empowering. local. I mean, one story is they were able to help local farmers um, get the appropriate, because um, they don't have as good communication over there. And so when they go and sell their produce, they just go and they sell it for what they can sell it for, or someone will come to their farm and say, I'll buy your produce for X, and they don't really have an option to do anything else. Mm. And so they were able to help the local farmers have better communication around and know what their produce was actually worth and get the um, mm. get what it was actually worth. So, um, yeah, stuff, stuff like that, that it, the goal is to, to help people in a holistic fashion, right? So... Um, working with helping them, you know, how, how can you grow, grow better crops? How can you live a healthier lifestyle? Um, and then, you know, we believe that part of a holistic life is uh, your spiritual life as well, right? So mm -hmm. encompassing that holistic aspect yeah. of living. You keep mentioning that. Okay, so they went in there for... Um, oh, well, how do you... How do you 
how do you go in somewhere and teach somebody how to eat more healthy? Yeah, you got to ask my When dad. they're used to doing <laughs> something else. Good question. And what are their unhealthy habits? Well, okay, I don't. I, I won't even ask you that. I'll ask you yeah. how you do it now with your family and friends and whatever. How do you do it yourself, even pushing seed time? Really, you're... you're I mean, that's one way to get people to eat healthier, get them to grow a garden. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. And my dad, when he moved to the farm and started farming, he liked to say that he was now doing public health at the grassroots level. Yeah. Like literally, because it's going back down to the basics of growing the food that you're eating. And so mm. I would say, you know, in a very large, broader scale, yes, even seed time is a part of that. Um because it's fundamentally, I mean, our mission is to make gardening and farming easier for people, um, to take away any those barriers of entry, that the complication, the overwhelm, the stress of trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. make it all, you know, ex uh, extremely simple, so yeah. anyone can jump in and start growing their own food. Um, so there's there's definitely that aspect to it. And then when it comes to like sharing about healthy lifestyle and stuff like that, yeah. um, we've, I mean in various factors and different ways. Uh, we've done cooking schools. We've done, my grandfather actually um, would do uh, CHIP programs, which was coronary health improvement project. Um, I think that it's changed its name now, but anyways. Um, so he would do like community and, th and then you just invite the community and people that are interested in that would come and, and um, go through the program and, and Again, just sharing holistically about health, about diet, about lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Just thinking out loud here. I've had I've known missionaries who've gone to Kenya, mm -hmm. and I'll say, you know, Kenya is the most Christianized nation in the world, like per capita. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask them if they were Christian, they would actually say yes. But then they would mention that, yeah, they'll say that, but they also have hang on to their animalistic ways as well and so they have this mix yeah so it just yeah. made me think at least you're with sea time and you were getting people to grow garden uh, they might not give up their junk food <laughs> but maybe they're eating more well and here's the uh, thing. healthy stuff because they've they're growing a garden yeah yeah and here's the thing you know anything that they eat that comes out of their garden is going to be way better than anything that came out of the grocery store oh, or yeah. something that they got from there. So every little step is a step in the right direction. Why do you say that? Direction. Why do you say it's so much better out of the garden? Yeah. Um, multiple factors, but one of the biggest is, you know, you're going to get, even if you, I mean, you know, you, we could go into, um, you know, regenerative gardening versus, you yeah. know, just regular commercial gardening, whatever. But even if you were going to strip all of that aside, um, the sooner that you eat something from after it's that it's picked, yeah, the more nutrients you're going to get from it. Because okay. uh, a vegetable, as soon as it's picked, it starts a process called respiration, oh. and it starts breaking down. Um, it's just that process of decay. And the nutrient content will um, immediately start dropping. And so, I mean you can go look at studies. They'll say like, you know, we might lose 30 to 40% of the nutrients by the time we actually eat a lot of just wow. the random vegetables that we get from the store. And if you think about it, you know, a green bean that is picked in California, it's going to take about a day and it, you know, transition to a truck. And then it may be a couple days on the road. Even if it gets to a store within, a, a, within another day, you know, it's, how long is it going to sit in the store? You know, it's probably on the shelf for a couple of days. Wow. It might sit in the back for a little bit. Um, by the time you get it, and then you take it home, and you might you might not even eat it for a couple of days, no, right? Don't. It's yeah. going to sit in your fridge. Um, sit up in there for up to a week. So oh, so the the produce that you're actually eating from the store can easily be a week or more older than when it was actually picked, right? Um, whereas if you pick if you have a garden, you, you pick it, you take it straight from your garden to your table. I mean, you're talking about minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's definite, like at a very fundamental level, you're going to get way more, more nutrients. And then if you, yeah. and then if you are incorporating, um, organic gardening, regenerative, um, 
gardening into that as well and focusing on building up the health and the microbiome of your soil and all of that. I mean, it's just going to increase it even more. Yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned that this health is a big push. And I know you're a Seventh-day Adventist because you mentioned it out there. And every Seventh-day Adventist I've met has had a health angle, Mm -hmm. passion for it. Where is that coming from? Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. So we come at it from the perspective of, number one, um, you know, from a spiritual perspective, we believe that our body is the temple of the Holy Mm -hmm. Ghost. You know, we want to be, um, we want to be filled with the Spirit of God, and we want to do everything we can to work with the natural um, system. I mean, God was the one who created us, who made nature, right? We want to, like with your with your garden, you want to provide the best environment for your plants to thrive, right? Yeah. And so the same with our health, we come from the same perspective. And I think it, we share that with a lot of people, like, you know, we want to provide the best environment for our bodies to thrive, to be resistant to d- disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so that is uh, kind of the primary background underlying focus of health. So there's the there's the mm-hmm. the spiritual aspect of it. Um, and then, but we feel like that's tied to just the the physical as well. Like you can't you can't completely separate spiritual and physical um, in the sense that um, we we live in a physical world, right? And uh, if I destroy, and it's not, it, let me put it this way, like if I, if I destroy my body's health, it can affect, affect me mentally, right? Mm-hmm. It can affect my relationships with other people even. Yeah. And we feel like in the same way it can affect our relationships with, with God as well. Um, you know, if your mind isn't as clear, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. if you went to a seventh, somebody went to a seventh day Adventist church and somebody's bringing some snacks, are they going to be donuts? Yeah, that's a good question. It really depends on the on the Adventist church that you go to. We okay. have <laughs> we, there's different definitions of what's healthy. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the Adventist church is extremely diverse, um, and you'll meet. I mean, you'll meet a lot of Adventists that have a very strong emphasis on health, and then you'll meet a lot of Adventists that. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty similar with any group of people. You have, you know, if you were going to put them in labels, you know, you have the conservatives, you have the, you know, the, the liberals, you have the, you have the broad spectrum of people that, you know, are much more into like caring about, um, caring about their health and then, and then others that, you know, it's, it's just not as high of an importance on their, on their list. And you have people with different perspective, differing perspectives on exactly what is the best healthy thing to do, yeah. right? So there's that whole aspect of it as well. Yeah, who gets um, to decide that? What is the most healthy thing? Yeah. So I think there are different ways to approach that. And I would just, I would say that there's, uh, there's kind of the first step is um, at least for Adventists and for the Adventist Church is to say, okay, let's just look at a biblical foundation of what you know what would be considered healthy um, from a biblical perspective, and um, that's one of the reasons why Adventists do choose to, um, if they're going to eat meat, they'll choose to eat clean meat instead of unclean meat because we feel like that was a um, differentiating factor that God had even back at the flood. Um, you know, even before he went into Levitical, like we don't necessarily believe that we're under the Levitical laws of of the Old Testament, but we feel like it was a it was a um, it was a health perspective that was carried through from the beginning, um, and and then if you're going to take it even further back, right? Uh, in the Bible, God initially. Mm. Um, with Adam and Eve in the garden after sin, um, he initially gave them 
the fruits and the vegetables and the nuts and the grains to eat. And it wasn't, uh, we don't have any biblical record of animals being actually given or saying, hey, you know, now you can eat the animals until the flood. Um, so there's, there's a whole, you know, I don't know, you know, years and years between uh, where, I mean, I, I'm sure that there probably were people that were eating meat before then anyways, but it's just, you know, biblically we don't see um, that example given until the flood. And so um, the, the Adventist church has taken the perspective that um, the closer that we can get back to more of the original diet, the better that it'll be for, okay. for your health. And so there's that kind of biblical foundation. And then there's the, you know, what, what, what are the effects in real life? Right. So um, there's something called the Adventist health study that has been done over, mm. over, I don't know how many years that it has been now. Um, but looking at, okay, let's look at, you know, Let's look at people that have, and the Adventist health study is specifically on Adventists, but they say, okay, let's look at different segments of Adventists that are eating in, in different ways and track their health over long periods of time and see what, you know, what are the differences. And um, interestingly, um, one of the interesting things that has come out of that is, uh, have you heard of the blue zones mm -hmm. before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... The, the blue zones are zones that have people have said, okay, I want to, let's look at, see where the longest living people yeah. in the world, right? And so there's like one in Japan and I think one in the Mediterranean and there's different areas where you have these very long living, long living people. And um, when they looked over across the world and said, where are the blue zones? One of them ended up being um, in Loma Linda, uh, which is a large community of Adventists. And oh. so they said, hey, let's look at, you know, what, what's going on here, because it was the only blue zone that was in a modern country, right, that is surrounded, wow. surrounded by our modern Western diet, basically, right? Um, and so, uh, so there's the aspect of just looking at it at a, at a scientific level as well and saying, okay, let's, let's look at the science, you know, what when it comes to longevity, when it comes to health, you know, what, what has a track record of being um, yeah. a good, healthy, healthy so we, lifestyle? If we go to an Adventist potluck, we're, we're, we, we may or may not see donuts. You may or may not see donuts. What about cheeseburgers? Yeah. yeah. We're definitely not going to see cheeseburgers? Again, In Some you places, know, it, we it, might. It absolutely depends on the church that you go to. So our church um, has a plant-based potluck, um, and... Basically, everything is uh, plant-based. There are churches, I would say the majority of Adventist churches, um, well, <laughs> if I was going to take, because the Adventist church is a worldwide church. Yeah, I can't right? ask you to speak for the whole <laughs> I can't, thing. If I was going to speak for the whole world, I mean, the majority <laughs> probably, you know, you're, you're going to see a, a very broad diet that, in, that includes but It sounds like you're not, you're not going to see a, a pork hot dog. You That's where they draw the line. You wouldn't sure. see a pork hot dog, yeah, okay. yeah. It'd be but even here in the United States, you'll see a spectrum of a church like ours who does plant-based potlucks to, you know, vegetarian, where it's just, you know, you'll you'll see, you may see um, cheese and milk and egg products, all the way to churches that will have um, chicken and and meat and other stuff there as well. I'm wondering what about. Uh lamb and passover so traditionally folks eat the year old lamb at passover yeah but i don't know remember if that was actually biblical or i don't remember yeah yeah is that matt do you know the bible <laughs> yeah yeah no it was i, Internet, I think it boy, was actually required i think that they had to it was required to, it was required it, so 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 yeah so Jesus ate lamb on Passover then. Yeah. And he ate fish. He actually so, ate fish after so he was resurrected. So y'all would be more likely to eat... We'd be more likely to find a lamb burger at this thing? At this potluck? You just don't eat much lamb here in the United States. I no, like. only a half a pound a person a year. Is that, is that the average? Is? Yeah. So, I mean, you'd be much more likely to find like chicken or beef or something or something that was regular. Um, hmm. But... 
Yeah, yeah. I thought it was. You're supposed to take the yearling lamb. The blood of the lamb was also used to mark doorposts. So that yeah. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Mm -hmm. So they were killing the lamb for something. Yeah. Yeah. So the the Aptness Church does not keep the uh, like the standard feasts of the like the Old okay. Testament feasts. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, oh, okay. you know, we don't like celebrate the Passover like it was celebrated um, okay. in the Old Testament, which, you know, means we don't do the sacrifices of the yeah. lambs and we don't eat them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, it's a, it's a good point. Like it was, it was required in the Jewish economy um, on Passover to eat the lamb. Um, and... Uh, the interesting thing about that is that if you look back to, and if you even go to countries in those areas and stuff like that, um, they will oftentimes still have a very large vegetable and plant-based diet, and the meat is kind of a delicacy that's like on, um, yeah, mm -hmm. on the side almost. It's, yeah. it's like added in as a as a delicacy. I mean, it's it's like the concept of someone coming over and they they kill the fatted calf for this special person mm -hmm. right because yeah because it's, it's a special a special thing um, and when you go to those to you know the blue zones um, they're not all vegetarian right I mean that even the Adventists aren't all vegetarian but other blue zones but one of the things that was significant in all the blue zones is it was a highly um, yeah you know the the plant based the the vegetables grains etc was a higher portion of their overall diet compared to the meat, meat portion of it so yeah i'm trying to get to the heart of it though so so sometimes religions can be following uh laws or or where, where the law is so that with this one it's coming from a heart for health mm -hmm. so somebody in the adventist world could also and perhaps should also go go down the train of conventional versus organic versus mm -hmm. growing at home and what you're telling us all in here here if you want to be a true steward of the temple of god then you're going to want to mo grow the most nutrient dense food possible yeah yeah and you're going to want to move away from you can have this rule that oh we're going to only eat vegetables but some vegetables are bologna because hey. they've been they're so old they're robbed of their nutrients they've been sprayed to all get out yeah I was just talking with a guy just the other day who knew of a girl who decided like she was just going to go plant based and she was eating like all of these microgreens and and you know you think that it's like super help uh, um, yeah healthy superfoods um, but she ended up with this huge oxalate imbalance in her body and it shut down her kidneys and uh, you know she ended up on dialysis and you know wow. so there's if you approach it you know if you just if you just approach it from just a rule standpoint like okay i'm not going to eat any animals i'm only going to eat this or whatever you can get yourself in a lot of trouble like if you're not if you're not looking at it as a holistic um, yeah okay concept if that makes sense any sense um because you can 100 percent go on a plant-based diet and end up completely trashing your health um, yeah because you could well i mean you could eat donuts you, could only, you could only eat donuts, right? And you could be like, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a plant-based vegan. vegan vegetarian, yeah. and all I eat is donuts." But yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, it's definitely, um, you know, for for us, and I'll just speak personally. It's we enjoy it. Like it's it's part of, I guess it's you know part of who we are, and it's not it's not something where, you know, if I when I grew up, my parents, um, we were vegetarian at home, but when we were overseas, you know, a lot of the people over there are obviously not, and we'd go over and visit people, and they'd have us over for meals and stuff like that, and um, my parents would give us kids the choice, and they, we would, they would say, hey, you know, we don't, we don't eat meat at home. If you want to try some, you can, um, and so, you know, I've had chicken. I've had I don't know, goat, lamb, whatever was over there. You know, I've I've tried it, but over the years, um, you know, it's just become something that, um, and it's not something that, it, you know, it's not like this rule-based scenario where if I was to try some of your chicken, I would feel like it was, you know, violating a, 
uh, um, my conscience or something like that. Um, it's definitely more of a, um, you know, I want to be the healthiest person that I can. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, the path that we've chosen is what we believe is the, the healthiest, you know, as far as we know. Mm-hmm. But of course, there's things that we're going to learn too, right? Um, it's all, it's, um, it's a learning, learning, growing experience. Yeah. But. Okay. So when you guys are living in this tiny house, 400 square feet, three children, how, 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 how do you have time to work on a computer to create seed time? <laughs> how do you get some business done? Oh, man. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. You're an entrepreneur. Uh, you're a stay-at-home Stay-at-home dad, dad entrepreneur. Home. Um, so I work in the bedroom, the family, okay. the family is out in the living room. We're talking, I, I need to get my own office really, but how's that um, going to happen? Like in town? No, no. We shed. Yeah, go, go get a low shed. We're considering like getting a, a separate shed that we'd make okay. into an office. Um, so you know, eventually we'll, excuse me, eventually we'll build or. I don't know, buy a larger so place or something like you that. You work with your dad. Where where do you and he meet? Yeah, good question, because they are actually in transition right now to a new home as well. Um, so we would, uh, when we would do like webinars and live events and stuff, we would go up to my parents' place. And okay. then they moved. And so that's where we had a webinar with you? You were at yeah. your dad's? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Does he normally get on the webinars with you? A lot of them. A lot of them that we, I would say, most of the webinars yeah. we do together. For those that don't know, you launched a software that plans your garden. I mean, that will help you plan your garden. Yeah. And Rebecca and I got on board with it this year, and she really loves it. And she's the gardener. I'm the farmer. Hus- hus- I'm, Hus- the, I'm the shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm animal the animals. husbandry. Uh, yeah. And that works good because she likes to eat the vegetables. I like to eat the meat. So yeah. you best put somebody in charge who likes it, you know? Who, yeah. Because yeah. so she's in charge of it and she likes it. And what's one thing I like about it is she can plan it all out and then print out the honey to do list. Yeah. You know, she can print out the weekly checklist of what we're supposed to do that week. That's I awesome. remember when we first started out, we had to, um, uh, organize the garden and you know we're just writing it out manually and it would probably take a week or so yeah of planting the garden and then the complication part was when you actually get to the field and if you need to plant in this row versus that row or if you get a week behind well then you're like erasing and marking things out and starting all over really right but with seed time it's just a click of a button so i am interested though because you guys were manufacturing coffee pots at some point. Oh, and then seed time took off. So what else were you trying though at this time? Was that it? That was it at that time. Yeah. So <laughs> I had <laughs> What are the chances you come in here and the one thing you were piddling with is in my I couldn't studio. believe it. I walked in here, I was like, that is that, <laughs> I can, it's our co- Matt, he that's made our this electric coffee kettle. Pot over here. I'm gonna yeah. have to get this coffee pot to show everybody. Yeah. Well, it's too bad they can't get one now. Yeah, it's done. We we sold out. <laughs> Limited edition. The one stainless steel coffee situation. The lid, see, is stainless steel. And it's not just so what happens with a lot of them is the the lid here. Mm-hmm. They would put stainless steel. Well, they put stainless steel in the middle here. Yeah. But it would be plastic all on the edge. I see. And so uh purists yeah, didn't like that because you've got the steam and it's just broiling against yeah. the plastic or whatever. So, anyways, what we did is we re- remanufactured the lid and pulled that stainless steel all are the way out. Are to you the a edge. purist? So, yeah. Well, I like to. I consider. How's this going on your radar? Are you crazy for coffee? You didn't even want coffee this morning. Yeah. Most no. people come here at this hour and yeah, they need the, a whole mug. Yeah. The funny thing is, we I, I don't drink coffee, so we use it for. Uh, tea, like yeah, herbal yeah. teas, and eats it up fast. It's also, I mean, they're they're so versatile for. Um, you want a piece of that? Yeah. 
All right. <laughs> <laughs> It's going up on eBay. We're starting it at 99 cents. <laughs> Link in the description. <laughs> it's the only, it, you can't buy them anymore, so we're going to auction it off on eBay. Popular Japanese brand. I won't mention that you have to replace the seal about every two years. Oh, uh, really? Every three years, you have to replace the silicone seal of your seal. Is that we right? we got to get you a mic, too, Matt. Yeah. He's saying he's got a Japanese yeah. product where the seal wears out. No, maybe we'll have so to. So were you just stealing that then? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> he was just getting it out of the shot. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I forget where, where well, we were. Well, we were but, talking about your entrepreneurial adventure. So um, you sound like you're coming from an angle of what's the problem? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Because what happened was... Um, it began with my uncle who started an organic farm. Then my dad partnered with him. He invited my dad to come join him. And our, the two of our families ran the farm together. We grew 50 to 70 different varieties of vegetables, herbs, berries. Um, and it was small-scale, intensive vegetable production, Elliot Coleman style. I mean, yeah. he was like the mentor, right? So we were reading his books. Eventually, we went up and visited his farm, et cetera. And... Um, so I spent many years working with the family business, and then I just didn't feel like that was my calling. I didn't feel mm. called into commercial farming. And so um, I really enjoyed teaching. I had a bit of a web design tech knowledge. So um, I ended up count counseling with <laughs> someone who now is my father-in-law, and he said, hey, why don't you go into uh, teaching gardening online? And so, uh, long story short, that's what I did. I started teaching people how to grow their own food more on a home scale, homestead level instead of the commercial scale. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2013. And uh, we did that for many years and seed time was birthed out of that. Um, but I, I would say the seeds from it come all the way back from that experience on the farm because I remember one of the first uh, things my my dad and my uncle uh, started an apprenticeship program and they put us kids through the apprenticeship program. And one of the things that we had to do was figure out how to do crop rotation with the crops and figure out where the crops were going to go and which crop was going to follow the other one. And we had all these three by five cards. And it just gets really complicated really fast, especially when you're doing a lot of different crops. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, you know, f from early on, I knew that crop planning can be extremely complicated. And then when I started teaching people how to grow their own food, you know, it, it came up as something that, you know, it's, it's stressful, it's overwhelming, you know, to try and figure out what should I do, when should I do it, how do I figure out my crop plans? And so, yeah, going back to what you said, you know, identifying a problem, um, that was the problem. And, and the way that it actually began was my dad and I, so my dad and I have, uh, he's been involved with my teaching business from the beginning. Um, we have uh, actually a membership where he and I will do a live meeting once a month with our, um, we call them our elite group of gardening students. And um, we promised our students, we said, hey, we'll create mm. a weekly checklist for you of what you should do in your garden for each week based on your location. And... I had some ideas of how we could like pull this off just in my head. But at the same time, I think it was a bit of, we, I don't think we even maybe fully understood the, <laughs> the complexity of what we were promising our students. Um, so I had these ideas and I was like, okay, but now once you promised it, cause it was a bonus to like purchasing our gardening course or being a part of our gardening membership that we were like, Hey, as a bonus, we're going to add this on. Uh, it's going to make your life easier. Right. And, and then very but, easier if, if you pulled that off. Yeah. And then it was like, man, how, <laughs> how are we actually going to pull this off? Cause every location is different with, with gardening, right? Everyone has different frost dates, um, different zones, you know, they so have different vegetables. They might want to grow too. Very true. Tastes and very market. True. Yeah. Because these are for market farmers or are these for homesteaders? This was for this home point? gardeners. This was for oh, home, home gardeners, cool. homesteaders, yeah. So once we made that promise, um, it eventually came down to fulfillment, right? How are we going to fulfill this? And I remember just spending hours 
scouring the web for some kind of program that I could use to help with this process. And eventually, I landed on a third-party um, calendar platform called uh, TeamUp. And I contacted them, and we negotiated, and they were extremely helpful for us. And uh, if anybody wants, like, a team calendar, go check them out because they're, they're a great team calendar um, platform. And we they ended up letting us create multiple. I mean, we had, like, 26 different calendars that were built out for different locations. We put in all of these crops and succession plantings of the crops, and then – what we did is we would have the, the user uh, find the calendar that matched their <clears throat> prostates for their location. And then they could go in the calendar and they could choose the crops from a list and it would drop them into the calendar and it would show when to seed them, when to transplant them, expected harvest time. Um, there was a little task list that kind of populated from that. Um, at the same time, uh, well, so the first time that we released those calendars to the community, the the community just went wild. The chat, yeah. the chat blew up, and people were just so excited. They were like, "Man, this is incredible! We we love this." Um, that didn't account for garden size, though, did it? It didn't. No. Yeah, and it, and it had uh, significant limitations in that we put in these suggested planting times, but people couldn't move them around. You know, it was very. Um, kind of locked in place. Okay. Um, however, it was a proof yeah. of concept, mm -hmm. and the people in our community, you know, already it, there was enough value with them that they were already super excited about it. Uh, but I mean, as, as soon as we launched them, we were, and we saw the feedback, we saw the response. We said, "Hey, you know, it's, we, at some point, we've got to create our own app that makes it easy for people to." do this, but then have it be adjustable so people can fine tune their garden plan. And, you know, you forget to seed your lettuce one week. Well, make it so that people can move it over to the next week. Right. And have it auto, auto -cal recalculate everything yeah. uh, for you. Or lettuce gets destroyed or the kids plant it in the wrong bed or you plant it in the wrong bed or there the you internet go. goes yeah. out and you guess which one was the right bed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. So that's, um, that's where Seed Time was um, birthed out of. And it was actually COVID, the whole COVID, mm -hmm. you know, fiasco that ended up um, spawning the birth of Seed Time because the interest in gardening just kind of skyrocketed. And we ended up... Um, um, do you, is that still jamming? Seed time or Co the COVID craze? The COVID craze, it's it's definitely um, it's definitely flattened out. Yeah, it's more. <sighs> yeah, it I'm was more just too. like that one that one year, this especially the spring of what was 2020 it twenty twenty and twenty twenty one twenty twenty one was yeah. nuts. Yeah, so what do I call these now? COVID gardens, all these abandoned gardens. Yeah, we need to get into a. You know, there was the there was the. Um, survival garden what was it during the world war ii the victory, the victory gardens garden. yeah and mm -hmm. everybody had a garden we need like a thrival garden or 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 some 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 reason to have a garden in good times yeah 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 because you know everything goes bad and then people are like man we got to grow our own food but then it's usually too late i mean it's too late you know it, food takes time to grow and that's what's happening you know yeah. people got into homesteading because of it and or gardening or whatever and then it's so hard yeah and you're too late and so you're doing all this work and you're just learning and you're not getting a much of reaping you're not reaping much of what you sowed because yeah. you suck yeah yeah that you got to suck for a while you got to put in that time yeah, and hopefully we can shorten that process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you can become a become a pro uh, faster. But you know, yeah. we all are going to have the, the experience of learning from trial and error. I don't think you could. Um, you know better than I do because it's your business. But somebody my, like me could you could have another tier 
Mm-hmm. So you have your t- most homesteaders are going to want to do it themselves. That's mm-hmm. that's mostly how they are. That's why they're homesteading, uh, not necessarily for health. I mean, we'll maybe go back to that in a minute, but it's more of a I want to do everything myself. I want to provide all my own needs. Yeah, self sufficiency. And, and so they're going to yeah. want to learn how to use this software and do it themselves. But there will be people who say, "Well, I just want to." Sp- I want a consultant for an hour mm-hmm. to to help me make my plan. Yeah. So there's that person who will pay much more money mm-hmm. for that one hour because they value their time versus the typical homesteader who will spend eight hours <laughs> figuring it out themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who don't necessarily value their time so much. And then, yes. uh, but then, then there's the person who will say, to go even further, who really values their time and say, these are the vegetables we like to grow. They want to fill out a short survey and then they want you to give them the plan. Do it for me, yeah. But you're going to have to charge a lot of money for that. Yeah. You, but but you're my, you, I mean, consider adding some tiers. I mean, we've had some grand success always having some tiers yeah. where you're already marketing one thing. You're marketing seed time. You do already have, you had at least two tiers on that webinar. We do. Mm-hmm. But there's people that always want to go the next level. Yeah. Yeah, and, we don't and, we don't have that done for you, um, or but that's tougher. I mean, you have to train level. people yeah. to help in in consulting, but that's a that's another level because we're going to have to win the war against conventional agriculture with convenience. Mm-hmm. That's how it's going to have to win. We're going to have to get in people's phones, and people are going to have to be able to order um, healthy things on an app and it be delivered within two hours. Right, yeah. That's how the sustainable, the regenerative ag is going to be big ag. Yeah. We're going to ha- we're gonna have to be the Ubers of what Ubers did to taxis and what Airbnb did to ho- hotels. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, somehow farmers are going to, or any homesteader could have an excess of cucumbers and somehow put it on a market p- to be delivered to their neighbor 30 minutes away somehow yeah i don't have that answer i hope somebody takes this idea and goes with it and does it yeah absolutely Um, so they i saw a some member in my membership area posted a picture of a old magazine article or it had a a layout of a garden Mm -hmm. and it showed you exactly what to plant here here's the exact thing that appeals to me some ways, mm-hmm. but I do realize, well, I've got six raised beds. My my crop garden has to be this size. Nobody, it's it's hard to get every. It would be hard to get everybody, even a fifty foot by twenty foot mm-hmm. plot necessar- necessarily. You know what I mean? Yeah. Somebody might be in a uh, development, and they might need to have raised beds mm-hmm. for HOA reasons or something. They might be on the slope. Yep. Yeah. So, so your seat time is on it because people can be do different things. Yeah, and you know, I think one of the else, also the things with that is a lot of these plans that have just like a pre-built, and we even have a little plug-and-play garden plan that we have available, right? Where you, oh, you do. Um, yeah, we do actually. Uh, where you know it has it kind of mapped out. There's two aspects of it. One is your garden space may be totally different, right? Different bed layout, different bed setup. Um, but the other thing to it with it is that a lot of those uh, layouts, they're just going to have one planting of all of those crops laid out, right? Um, and what happens? Oh yeah. What mm-hmm. happens with a lot of people is yep. they they do that and they just have one planting. And garden become gar- the garden just becomes this seasonal thing where it's yeah I planted everything in the spring I harvested it in the summer and then it's done and yeah. and you don't have but what we're finding is that a lot of people love I'm only gonna push this a little closer because yeah. of the machine yeah so we're that's fa- giving me thumbs up <laughs> very cool whoa he revved it here he goes so um. We're finding that a lot of people have loved the concept and the idea of having a continual harvest out of their garden. Yeah. They want to be able to replace the grocery store with their garden, kind of what you guys were talking about wanting to do this year too, right? And in order to do that, if you want to eat vegetables consistently all year long, 
it can't just be a spring planting and then I'm done. There has to be succession plantings. Um, yeah. Or sometimes I call them leapfrog plantings where you have one crop that goes in. When it's coming out, you have another one that's coming in in its place. And that whole concept of and planning process is another level of complexity because now you're dealing with time as well as space and each crop is going to be in the ground a different length That's of right. time, mm -hmm. right? And knowing when the next one is going to go in and getting it started early enough so that it's ready to be transplanted if you're going to transplant it in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is where we see uh, really the ultimate extreme power of seed time coming in is being able to help someone plan those succession plantings yeah. um, and create a plan that becomes part of their lifestyle where, you know, we took our farming experience where we're seeding something almost every week, right? And yeah. said, mm -hmm. hey, you can just scale that down to your garden. And as long as you have a little checklist that's keeping you on task, like, you know, if you can make out your garden plan in a calendar and then you have a checklist that helps you track it, it doesn't take that long to seed a few plants of kale, right? And if you just have a, a small amount of time each week, you go and you do that, um, you, you can set up this continual harvest. Um, and it can make it a lot easier. Yeah. I remember when I first started gardening, I remember, this is a confession, really, because I remember thinking, can I plant after? I just had no idea. Like, people have no idea. I had no idea, and people listen to this, some of them have no clue. I seriously wondered, I grew something, could I plant something after it in that same season? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're talking about. You're, yeah. what, and gardeners call it succession planting. I didn't know at the time that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have Mr. Google Pants. to. You could go on there and ask that now. And it, you would ask Mr. Google, how do, how do you, can I plant after crops in the same year? Yeah. And mm -hmm. you're probably going to learn for Mr. Google Pants, that that's called succession planting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for whatever that's worth, um, and what you're talking about here is you can, you you grow these cold hardy crops in the spring, so you grow onions and cabbage and collards and kale. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even you vegetarians surely don't like, you don't like oh, all the on, vegetables, I surely. I love kale. Okay, you like kale. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kale, no. Uh, Feed it to the pigs. <laughs> you're so <laughs> funny. Uh, uh, yeah. No, no they, but you gotta, you gotta get like There's one vegetable kale. you don't like. Please tell me. Let me think of a vegetable that I don't like. Celery? Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of raw okay. celery. All right, you, you, still, you still gain celery. credibility. If you're about to tell me you like every single vegetable... You've lost me. <laughs> yeah, we got to be authentic, right? I mean, cauliflower. The, I do like cauliflower. Okay. If you if you roast it, <laughs> like if you roast cauliflower with like a breading. Uh, on okay. It, oh man, it's see so now you've good. probably gotten really good at making vegetables. Yeah, there's one some really one good one friend I had. He did say, "You don't have any bad ingredients. You just have bad recipes." So fair enough. You know. Yeah. Uh, we learned that with zucchini, if you so, I do like low carb fruits like okay. zucchini. A lot of people consider that a vegetable, but it's not, it's a fruit. Mm -hmm. Yes, so yeah. it wants to be eaten. And we learned that you know, if you do noodles, and we don't do grains, so we're low carb, and so we try zucchini noodles. Mm -hmm. Well, it usually gets runny, but we've learned if you slice some lasagna style. And put them in the dehydrator. Okay, yeah. Then you can use it as a lasagna or then turn it into a noodle. Yeah. And it doesn't leave a plate of half water. Interesting. Know, in your baking dish. Yeah, yeah. So what's cool. a good, what's a good uh, vegetable recipe? What's the best thing? What do you look forward to the most if it's on for dinner? Wow, yeah. Now we're getting into <laughs> favorite foods. That's a hard call. I like... <laughs> If I, one of the first things that came to my mind just in the vegetable realm is I love roasted vegetables. Um, okay. Sweet potato fries. Put it, uh, yeah. Really, any you can do like tons of different types, you know, beets, um, 
I'm not a huge fan of roasted carrots, but I like uh, potatoes, beets. Um, you can throw broccoli on there. You can throw, you know, cauliflower in there. You can do all kinds of roasted veggies. Those are really good. Um, other other meals uh, that I really enjoy. Man, a lot of stuff. <laughs> you <laughs> I'm can very probably hard. Cook you can ask my wife. I'm very hard. It's very hard for me to just come up with like my favorite foods. Okay, so is the like wife is the wife going nuts in 400 square feet with all the kids? <laughs> yes. Cook, trying to cook. <laughs> oh man. I mean, asked how you get hard. your business done. How you do seed time? How does she cook? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and the little kids. They're little kids. They're little. Yeah, five and under. Um, Natasha does really well really well for, for the space that we have. And, um, it's, it's been something that it's been an adjustment over Mm -hmm. time. Um, and we would not, it would not be authentic at all to tell you that it's just been peaches and cream. (laughs) the entire. No, (laughs) you would lose us. You would lose all credibility. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, we, we've definitely had our, our challenges and, um, and, Struggles. They, our kitchen is actually set up quite nice, um, hmm. so there hasn't it. It hasn't necessarily been the pain point, ex- just except for the fact that it's small enough that you put anything on the counter and yeah. immediately the kitchen looks like it's a spoon is out. Uh, yes, it's a mess. Yeah, it's a mess, right? So that's that's kind of <clears throat> that's kind of a bummer. But other than that, it's enough space to easily easily cook and. Um, it, at least for one person. Yeah. Two people in there, it gets a little crowded. We lived in a 280 square foot bus. Okay. You got it messy, easy, and but you cleaned it up easy too. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Fast. Fast to clean up. Um, for the most part. Did you always want to stay at home? As like as a... Did you want to be a stay at home dad? Stay at home dad. That's not normal. Yeah. Yeah, good question. I mean, it's not even normal nowadays that the woman stay at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And now there is this... At least among my friends, we're even trying. I had an idea to be home. I wanted to be home with yeah. the kids too. Yeah, yeah, I um, did. I did as well. I had never, I never had a desire or dream to be off working away from the family. Yeah, why not? And I where do you was, think that came? I think from? it was something that grew over time, and I think part of it was especially as we came into. Our teen years, you know, that's close to when we moved to the farm. Yeah. I was in my mid-teens when, when my family moved to the farm. And um, I actually went to an academy for the last couple of years, but I was on the farm in the summers, and then I, oh. moved, and then I moved back and um, just went straight into working with the family business. And there's, there's something really special about working together as a family, and um, there's... As I, you know, thought about having my own family, I... And you're, hey, get in. Get in. you got to play quiet. Thank you, my man. There's something very special about the... I have a real value. I want to be a part of my kid's life, right? I want, I want to be a part of their educational experience. I want to be a part... And I really want to build a close bond and, and relationship with them. And I feel like one of the best ways to do that is to to spend life together. Right. Mm. And so, um, that is a huge part of wanting to work from home, live from home. I actually spend, I mean, with seed time right now, I spend too much time on the commute computer. Uh, I want to, How much? I want to take that ratio <laughs> and, uh, well, one of the, the challenges with seed time right now is that it has grown quite quickly. And so in that scaling process, you know, it, it takes more, you know, it's, you have a lot more people coming on and using the platform. You got more support for it. We're doing more marketing for it, et cetera. How many members did we send you? Ooh, did you send us um, total? Last time I looked, it was over 1,700 some. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what kind of growing pains did that cause? Or were you totally ready? We were pretty ready at that. At, well, well <laughs> uh, good question. Because right after, right after that's 1,700 people, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Right after our event with you all, um, 
our customer service, we have a girl that works customer service yeah. with us. She went on vacation, I believe uh -oh. it was. And we had a new girl that was coming in. Oh, we no. were trying to train her on. And we had a conference we were going to. <laughs> and so it was, it was kind of wild. This spring has been a little bit wild. So you had to tell everybody, just um, give us a week. Uh, yeah, we put it. I mean, we put a little vacation, back. not of it. It's called a vacation responder, but just the auto responder that was like, hey, you know, we've got a lot of people coming into seed time right now. You're super important to us. We will get back. Yeah. To, we will get back to you. Well, um, I noticed you closed on the Sabbath, too, when we launched, we mm -hmm. which then made me wonder. Uh, it made me wonder and think maybe you were keeping the Torah because you were. Um, well, you're not supposed to buy and sell on the Sabbath. Mm hmm. So is that a seven, is that an Adventist thing too? Yeah. Or is that mm -hmm. just your personal choice to find rest? Yeah, it's a it's an Adventist thing as well. Okay. Um, and it's basically, again, it's kind of going back. I'd like to put it in the in these terms: looking for principles that apply across time, um, biblical principles and um, and and guidelines. And and so when we go back and we see the Ten Commandments, we feel like those were commandments that were not just tied to a, you know, a set people, time, and space, but, um, you know, the Sabbath was instituted at creation. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, re, uh, re-spoken, as you were, in the Ten Commandments, but it's actually point, you know, the Ten Commandments were pointing back to a Sabbath that was instituted back when Adam and Eve were created even before sin. And then, um, you know, going forward... Obviously, Jesus kept the Sabbath when he was uh, here as well. And, you know, there's scripture references to keeping the Sabbath in heaven. Uh, so we see it as a, you know, more of a broad eternal principle versus just a law that was for a time and a space, or, yeah. if that makes sense. Do you, how many hours a day do you spend on seat time? You're saying you spend too much time on the computer. Yeah. How too, much is that? Too much. <laughs> um, right now... Recently, I've I've been working overtime, so probably I'm going to say eight to ten. Okay, eight uh, to ten hours a day. Ten hours a day. Okay, so it's hard being a at home it's, entrepreneur too. It, the office is always right there. Oh man, yeah, yeah. And like I said, like my goal is to cut that way back and have a lot more time. Well, what's stopping I'll, you? Right now, it's uh, building a team. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you, know, do you know how to build a team? It's my first time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's amazing. We're, we're finding it out. We're figuring yeah, it out. Yeah, learning that, too. Uh, yeah. You know, it, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. And so, um, it, we, it, I mean, you met Luke. Luke, we, Luke came, was on your vlog earlier. He is awesome. Luke's the one that nailed me for y'all. So. That's right, yeah. yeah. He's, that's a good teammate, bud. He, he has been a huge um, part of our team started with us last year and um, you know he's, continue on into this he's year. He's what? He is He's done so much for CTM. Marketing. Yeah, and uh, connecting, you know, connecting with um, so, influencers like you all, okay. connecting with so other businesses. How do you stretch that if you don't mind I'm asking because I'm trying to hire a marketing person mm -hmm. and, and hire somebody to do affiliate for Abundance Plus. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, here's you a full-time job or a part-time job, and this is what you get paid, or is, do you work out commission, or what do you do? Yeah, with him, we work out, uh, he's currently on a salary okay. as well as a commission. Okay. Um, so so he has an incentive to, um, being entrepreneurial myself, mm -hmm. I want to build a team of entrepreneurs. Okay. I don't want to build a yeah. team of people that just have an employee mindset where I just mm, do my own thing, good. right? So I want everyone to be incentivized on our team, just as like I'm incentivized with the business, right? To to push it forward, to push the limits, et cetera, et cetera. So um, oh, that's good. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, and I, I think about it that way with my kids. I want them to be around. I'm not automatically assuming that they're going to leave. Yeah. They're going to get out of the house, you know what I'm saying? But they're not going to leave this farm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to assume that. Sure. I'll support them if that's what they end up wanting to do. 
um, which has involved a mindset of a team of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. out of my children. Like, I'll support you in what you're doing. Yeah. The, the boys in their airsoft, Lily and her horses. Mm -hmm. But how are we going to build business around it? She's talking about boarding. She's talking about doing lessons. We were making content. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I know. So I'm, I'm producing for them, yeah. making content on stuff that has nothing to do with homesteading, but it's their own thing here. Yeah. But I'm going to talk about building a team of entrepreneurs. So yeah, that makes sense. So then Luke can be his own boss, work from home, have his kids around. Yeah. I mean, he's, and, got, a, he's got a working farm. He farms. Okay. And so this is, so he does other things. Yeah, that's an advantage of the entrepreneur. You you can do other things yeah. if you want. So you also you give him a base. So so there's a minimum requirement from him then. Yeah. So we have a um, like I said we have a he last year we actually we were actually just contracting with him okay. and then this year he's come on as an employee um, on salary and okay. Um, I mean, he's the kind of guy that just, he, he goes the extra mile. So it's not okay. something that we are, you know. How do you find that guy? He found us, actually. Okay. So um, That's you know, how you find the guy. <laughs> that's how the you guy find that it. finds you is the guy that you want the being you your want. marketer. That's right. Because <laughs> they're aggressive and they go after you, right? And they follow they up her, right? and all that. Yeah, yeah. That defeats the point if you're going out to find the marketer. The marketer needs to be yeah. knocking down your door. <laughs> exactly. Now exactly. that's a good marketer, right? Yeah, and if they love what you're doing enough that they're going to come after you, you know, that, yeah, it makes a big difference. Um, so, and uh, to be honest, yeah, we have not yet done any major, like, prospecting. Uh, we have a lot of people yeah. that reach out to us that would like to work with us, Um so he came to you We've, saying, "I can, I, I can sell this." Some has just been word through word of mouth. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he can sell, because he sold, he sells represented and sold other things. So he's mm -hmm. saying, "Oh, yeah. I think I could do something with seed time." Yeah. And did he come out with you with this? Did you even have to come up with the base salary commission, or it's did he pitching? I something? would say that it it was something that we worked with. Okay. It was a right. teamwork together that we figured out. Yeah. So he charge. Uh, so that's been good then. So, so so your main marketing revenue that, or avenue is 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 affiliates. We do a lot of paid advertising as well. Are you successful so, there? Mm -hmm. Who manages those? We have another company that we actually contract with who does the. So I do a lot of right now. I do a lot of the um, actual marketing content. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, shooting our ad videos and stuff like that is something that is still on my plate. It's something that I'd like to move off to. So I need to find a, another marketer <laughs> like so, you. So, so you um, don't want to be the face anymore? No, I would, I would still continue to be the face, but I'd like to find someone that would actually, um, and actually mm. we do have someone that we're employing right now that is going to do some more video editing for us. Uh, but, okay. you know, like the video editing side of things, um, scheduling emails, building out our web pages for I our see. events and stuff like that. Um, that's something that um, we... One thing I've had success, you have a big enough audience, you have enough people in seed time, is this is at least how I find my editors and I'm working on finding marketers this way. Yeah. Is I put, I wanted another editor. We needed a backup editor. Mm -hmm. I uploaded the vlog footage and I, I, I splattered to the audience, hiring an editor, $500 win, for best edit. Nice. And a chance to work with our team. Mm -hmm. You got 24 hours. So everybody got the same footage. It was so fun. Because that's, yeah, that's really everybody cool. got the same footage, and we got at least a dozen, yeah. if not 20, a couple dozen yeah. entries and takes. It's like... You know, AI before AI editing, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, AI editing is not there yet, but. Right, yeah. Uh, it's that, like the crowd that, AI. The humans, yeah, cr crowd, crowdsource editing, and I had all these different versions in 24 hours, you know. Well, I slept or made another video. Yeah. And we picked picked one, and I mean, it was so good that, yeah, he was able to join the team, and we had only promised 500 to a winner. Yeah. And. You know, that relationship has developed and um, they keep doing the vlog. And 
then doing some filming and then all of a sudden they're they're moving here and I'm gonna have a shooter. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. So consider that. That's I've awesome done that idea. from eight years ago when I didn't even know how to edit. Uh, yeah, I should shoot it out and say stuff hey done. Build me a yeah. webinar funnel with all the pages. Where you're trumping me is uh I need to be in the affiliate space. I need an affiliate manager to be mm -hmm. growing us in that way. I need to I feel like to grow abundance plus two, we ought to expand mm -hmm. outside of just homesteading. Yeah. Into hunting, cooking, homeschooling, very relatable stuff, mm -hmm. but health, but our much bigger industries. Yeah. The other related skills. Yeah. And that. and things that wouldn't forsake the current member. Right. Yeah. A current member would be excited about Right. A health series or a yeah. hunting series or a yeah. homeschool series, cooking. But we could reach a new market. And then ads. We're just figuring that out too, though. Yeah. There's the three big things, and you're missing the first one, I think. Um, Do you know what it is? Organic. Yes. Social. Yeah. Yeah. You got to start posting. <laughs> yeah. We do this year. <laughs> I know. It's free. It's, it's true. It's free. You have to pay for it. You're giving Facebook all that money. Come I on. I know. I don't want to, you know, we. I don't mind you giving Luke that money, right? Do you feel, <laughs> I don't mind that at all, right? Like giving a, giving a guy, a hustler, some commission and, uh, yeah. and yeah. some partners, some other people with similar concepts. Oh, man. But. Yeah, I know. I don't, I don't like giving money to Facebook and Google either. Um, mm -hmm. We'd love to, to, um, you know, there's different aspects of it. One is diversification. Yeah. So, like, you know, I don't know if we'll ever stop paying for ads um, unless we just decide that it's, like, if it gets to the point where, like, I can't ethically pay for ads on Facebook anymore or something, yeah. <laughs> something like that. But um, but it's the, working for you. You're getting positive ROI. We are, Yeah. Okay. It's it's worked very well actually. Why can't you just put the gas on that? I can't understand that. You know, because we we we've been doing paid ads for mm -hmm. several months, and they positive IRI, but it's like we can't just put the gas on. Yeah. So what happens is it's a bidding system, right? Yeah. And Facebook is so you think of it like a pool of people, mm -hmm. and Facebook, you know, there's this segment that is going to be the most interested yeah. in your, and so Facebook is constantly trying to figure out what that segment is that's going to be most in interested. Okay. And that's going to be a set, like a, okay. a set number of people. I mean, it, you know, it's I see. bigger low. And then as soon as you get beyond that, like yeah. Facebook is trying to find more people from the general population that would still be similar. And so mm -hmm. your ad costs start going up. Um, now, the more that you scale and the bigger that Facebook understands like your demographic and your your audience, yeah. et cetera. You can continue, like we're spent, we're, we've scaled way higher this year than we did last year. Um, and some of that is, um, some of that is probably relative to just Facebook understanding us better. Yeah. Uh, but some of it uh, is probably also to, you know, we've improved our marketing funnels and, um, and seed time has evolved as well. You know, we, we now have the layout portion of seed time where people can visually lay out their garden, which we was released last year, but this is our first spring season yeah. going into it. Yeah. With that. So yeah, good for there's, you. There's multiple factors with it. Yeah. And you get somebody to manage your, you have an agency managing your ads. We do. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine oh, has, a friend. An ad, has an ad agency. That's and, handy. Yeah, it is. Is he taking on any more clients? His agency, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, oh, the organic. Yeah, we need social. to do. We need you, to do more. You have a fascinating life. I mean, you're living in a 400 square foot. I don't know if you want a personal brand, but either way, you you can have a personal brand. Well, or thing, not. The thing is, it's so much easier. It's so much more relatable to have a brand with a face behind it yeah. than to um, than to just have a brand that's faceless. I don't see why you can't start at least. You have it right here. Just, I'm going to commit. I know, I'm going to do 100. <laughs> do 100. Seth Godin says you got to do 100. Yeah. 
do a hundred shorts, YouTube shorts, just little yeah. tidbits of, you know, I, I, I put together one and you, you could have done this. You know, we were planting onions out there today, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's steps to that. I mean, that's one angle of some content. Yeah. Hey, planting onions today, step one, you know, we bought these onion starts at blank, at, I feel like the more specific and plan you can give them, the better. Mm -hmm. We bought them here. Step two, we're soaking them in some water at least. If you have some fish fertilizer, I like this brand. Yeah. Uh, put it in it at this ratio. Soak them in it. Boom. Pull the tarp off. Do You don't use a gritter. You use a rake a bed to rake, mark yeah. your line. Mm -hmm. A bed rake. Yeah. And... You easily have a piece of content there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Greg Judy goes out with his phone, and it's, hey, this is Greg Judy. Today we're moving the cows from the old paddock to the new paddock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just one shot on his phone uploaded to YouTube. Yeah. Man, I need to do it. People are going to want you to be doing this by the time. They're going to be looking for you. <laughs> does he have so, a, does so he we have, have a youtube channel we do have a youtube channel and i have videos that are now like three years old because i was doing i was you know i, I was like we've got to do the organic right so I, I started doing youtube videos and then it was too much for me to edit them and everything so i now have a girl a friend of ours who is doing our instagram yeah and finally because i think when we did our uh, webinar with you. Our Instagram had like zero. I don't think we even had a post on there. Wow. Um, but anyways, so she's doing consistent content well, on there right it. now. Um, so we are we're moving in the organic. Um, I mean, you're paying somebody. You're paying Facebook to put out ads, so you I might know. as well pay somebody to do some ads. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I need I need to you do that. But but that's it too. Do you got to ask? Well, do I even have to do edits? No. What it? What do you mean? I mean, do Instagram stories? Oh, okay. Do mm -hmm. reels? Yeah. Do mm -hmm. YouTube shorts? Yep. Hey, I think a lot of people are going to start moving into there because it's not. I don't know. I've heard the rumors that TikTok's going away, and so a lot of people are down that, and they're going to be they're they're going to be coming to shorts. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And the side benefit of that is you get paid. YouTube's the only content platform I know of that. Pay. Besides TikTok, that pays, and they yeah. pay a lot more than TikTok. Yeah. And maybe X does now. That might be something worth paying attention to. Yeah, X is really more... Where it might go. It's really changing. Yeah. I think there's there's potentially a lot of... Um, and I've heard that they may even go in the direction of just, like, micropayments. Like, you know, if you want to watch this video, it's 50 cents or something oh, like that. Just, like, super, super small. So a very low barrier of entry. But just as to, opposed to like the monthly the fee or, type structure, yeah, yeah it it's it could be going somewhere. So we'll I'm paying see. attention to that and I'm posting there. Yeah, yeah, because nothing has done more good for us than just organic, just being ourselves. This is what we're doing, documenting it. Here we go. That's yeah. We need to do that. Yeah. A good take you, away from this. you, you, when we did that webinar together, I was impressed with how well you did. Well, thank you. Selling and but not being overbearing with it. The website and look good. You did a good job. You hired the company that built Calendly to build yeah. Seed Time, and you can tell mm -hmm. like it's well yeah. put together, intuitive. I do not have colorful enough good to say about their company. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Railsware and, uh, their development company. And, uh, like you said, they, they had Calendly hired them. Um, I was just with talking with the guy the other day, uh, all the way until they had, they had 10 developers from that company building Calendly before Calendly started pulling in their own, mm. like building their own in-house team. Oh, wow. Um, just, super dialed in processes and and really integrate into the business so they really integrate into um our business and and really understanding seed time and what we're doing and where we're going with it and and stuff like that really awesome 
awesome yeah. to work with them. Brilliant. I mean, the stuff that they've done, uh, you know, on our perspective, like we just tell them what to do, right? We say, hey, this is what we want. And they, they build it, but they've built like brilliantly. Like, I don't know how they connect the hmm. crops to the layout so that, you know, you slide across and they disappear and they show and all that kind of stuff. Cause I'm not, I'm not a developer, but, um, they've done an amazing job. Yeah. I mean, it looks simple, but the, the most complicated developments are the things that interface simply. Yeah. So yeah. they've done a good job and you did a good job there and you seem to have a natural or hard earned sense of marketing and business. I would say it's a hard earned sense. Yeah, I, I was, I'd never <laughs> considered myself a marketer in any line. I like, I was never, it was not a natural, like I'm not a natural salesman. Um, I've done door to door sales <laughs> before. Um, and it, it just, do, it does not come naturally to me. Like mm -hmm. I'm not someone that would just, um, but it's something that has been a learned skill over time and, you know, sales and marketing, some people can look at, uh, some people kind of get a little queasy with sales and marketing. It's like, mm -hmm. man, I don't want to sell people something or something like that, right? Um, and obviously there are like sleazy salesmen, right? And you come away and you're like, man, that was just, I don't, yeah. I don't like that, right? And so, um, but at the same time, like any business has to be able to get itself out in front of people and communicate what it's doing, the value of yeah. it and provide an offer and, and call people to action and say, Hey, you know, here's where you can get it. Um, get it for this amount, et cetera. And it's been a real learning process. Where did you learn that? I learned it when I started, it started with a mentorship. Actually. Um, there was a, a friend of ours who had an online business and he was um, teaching people how to move to the country, what kind of properties mm. to buy, what oh. you should look at, at um, in-country properties. Around? Sorry, I'm going to turn this down. Yeah. Um, I believe he still has the business. Um, it's been a while since I've actually swung back around and connected with him, so I'm not sure if he's still right. running that same course. But um so he had a he had a decent size email list and following, and he was you know he knew how to how to market and do a webinar and 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 do a you know a sales pitch or offer at the end, etc. And so um, I asked him. I said, hey, you know, I'm wanting to start teaching people gardening online, and um, basically said, hey, do you are you would you be interested in helping me get started or whatever? I don't remember exactly how that conversation went, but he he came on and he mentored me and he said, hey, let's do it. Um, we'll do the webinar for my audience. Mm -hmm. I'll affiliate with you. So I split commissions with him, um, and he got us off up and off the ground. Um, and there's a whole lot more story to that. But then from there on, um, it was a, a combination of that mentorship with him as well as just buying marketing courses online and and consuming the content and watching what other people do i like to you know i like to say that i've told i've said many times that uh a lot of what i do is just copying other people mm. uh, because you know you look and you see what other people are doing and what's working and you don't, you don't want to like plagiarize them mm -hmm. in, in that sense. But if you look and you see what other people are oh, doing yeah. and what works, um, and then take that and apply it to your own business. That's a lot. I took a, a uh, I fashioned a whole sales page once from, uh, Neville. I don't know his last name. Copywriting course was, he's a copywriter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I just looked at his sales page and like, he's, he, he knows how to write copy for a sales page. That's right. And just used it as a template. Yeah. That's what I do. I mean, that's what I've done. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that? Many times, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. No, no. I mean, so it's not like you're copying it word for word. You're just, you're just getting the heart of it. And oh, he he started with a story here. Exactly. He's, he's leaning into a problem right here. Oh, and then he's bringing in a solution. Oh, and he's saying, "I'm going to be your guide and take you through that." And um, yeah. And you know, a lot of those guys, they create frameworks for their sales pages, right? And they'll, they'll um, say, okay, 
these are the seven yeah. things that we're going to guide people through and it's going to start with the story and then we're going to hit the problem and then we're going to, you know, and so they'll yeah. create that framework. And then, you know, once you kind of learn those frameworks and you can learn it just by reading this, the sales copy, or you can, you know, sometimes they'll, if you join one of their courses or something, they'll give you a framework. Um, and then you just kind of, you can cr craft your own yeah. along those How lines. How did you get, okay. One, one of the ways is, so when we, even just casually mentioned seed time to our audience. They perked up and mm -hmm. stepped up and went and got it. And so yeah. that's one way we test things too. We like it. Yeah. But just my audience. But then when I see through a test, the audience leaning into this, mm -hmm. I then lean into it and push it to them. Right. Because, well, that's just proving it's, it's it's good, and I feel like I can get behind it. Mm -hmm. I can get behind it one if I believe in it, but it's that's not even enough, right? Because there's things I I I I, I you know I'm I'm reading a book on Alex Honnold, free soloing oh, El yeah. Capitan. I'm not gonna. I really love that and enjoy that, and we I mountain bike with the kids, but I'm not necessarily gonna push it on my audience, right? Right, right, yeah. But if I notice, hey everybody, go buy Al Alex Honnold's yeah, book. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I believe in the book. How, how does that relate but to I'm my I'm not homestead. really gonna. But you know, yeah. I might mention it in an email. You know, in one of my Five Point Fridays. Yeah. And if I notice people swarming to that and 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 just really relating to and tacking it, well then okay, maybe I need to pay attention. So this is what happened with Seed Time. So then, besides that, it's a great product. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And people can see the benefit. How did you do three hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter? Yeah. So that was a a culmination of many years learning marketing. Okay. Um, because see, we started. I started teaching people how to grow their own food online in two thousand thirteen, and we did that Kickstarter in twenty twenty one. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, you know, there's many years in there of learning the process of online marketing. And then uh, for the Kickstarter, because Kickstarter is its own little world. It's not just the regular. And that was sweet timing looking back. 2021, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Gardening. Yes. Yeah, it was very. Now, that was so much planned. Yeah, that, definitely not, not planned. Yeah. Um, but Kickstarter is its own little ecosystem, right? It's yeah. not just the regular online marketing platform. Um, and so I actually found a company that launches products on oh. Kickstarter. Oh. And I wanted them to launch Seed Time. I asked them to do it, and they refused. <laughs> they said, apps are too hard. We only wow. deal with physical products because we don't like doing software. And I said, okay, well, they had a course um oh and their course walked through the process of how they which was a lot cheaper launch. than hiring them yeah it was a lot cheaper than <laughs> hiring them but it was still like four thousand bucks i mean you know is a <laughs> is a decent a decent investment but oh. when you look at you know the potential returns you you invest you invest of in the course. course and you say okay mm -hmm. how how am i going to do this and so um uh they're called launch boom and i would I mean, I'll throw their name out because yeah. if, if anyone is interested in launching, hey, go check them out. They're an excellent source uh, for launching something on, on Kickstarter. And so I went through their course. I used their framework, applied it to seed time. Um, and that's how we launched out. Um, and basically what it is is you, you get a group, you advertise um, and you get a group of people that kind of pre-reserve, they'll put like a dollar down and say, hey, I'm really interested in oh. this. And so I'm going to put a dollar down to get notified to get the best deal okay, yeah. when you launch on Kickstarter. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, and then we built a community of those people and we coupled it with a multi-day garden planning live event that went over the exact same time as the launch. So we were teaching people how to plan their gardens. We were launching on the Kickstarter at the same time. We blended them together. It's a multi-day event, though. Where, where, where was that held? We did it online. What was the audience? Um, of all these pre-people? Yes, yeah. And you uh, did paid advertisement for those pre... Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And we were actually able to do, for those dollar reservations, we were able to do paid advertising to get the dollar reservation 
and then we would upsell people on our gardening course and um, and even this um, this multi day event. Okay. So people could and through that we were able to cover our advertising costs ahead of time um, or most of them. Okay. Um, so that was that was a nice thing. And then when you actually launch the Kickstarter, we have a group of highly interested people that are already interested in what we're doing and um, that we've kind of already building a community around. Mm -hmm. And we did a live event like the day before it launched, kind of, you know, gearing up for it and made a big thing about the launch. Okay. And, you know, we're going to offer lifetime accounts to, to it and stuff like that. And um, so then that's when we launched, um, it, it, it was funded in like 10 minutes and then just blew yeah, up. Yeah, that's good. There. You want to get funding right away. Yeah. And then what, what did your dad say about all this? Yeah. <laughs> did he think you're nuts? Like Kickstarter concept. That's kind of nuts for somebody of that generation. Yeah. No, he, you know, he has been a hundred percent behind it the whole way. Yeah. Um, he got it. He understood the Kickstarter yeah. concept. Like, yeah. you're getting money before it's built. Yeah. Or you had already built it. We had built a MVP. Like, okay. a very... Min yeah. Well, and, I mean, we were finishing up Minimal building. viable product. That's right, yeah, minimum yeah. viable product. We were finishing up the minimum viable product as we launched the Kickstarter. So we were actually able to demonstrate with it and show people, like, what it was going to look like. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, anyone that's listening now... You can go find us on Kickstarter. Just look for, go to Kickstarter yeah. or Google Seed yeah. Time Kickstarter and you'll that see it. That was my research on you, buddy. Going in, that's all I have <laughs> yes. with the Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a good glimpse into our back history and little story. Yeah. You can also see how far Seed Time has come because you can, in the video there, you'll see screenshots of our minimum viable product. Yeah. Before it looked nice. Are we your number one affiliate yet? You are. Yes. You. Took first place. Yeah. All right. Congratulations. Then, yeah, thanks. Yeah. We're going to keep blowing it out of the water. Yeah. It's not hard when the product's good. You know, it's one of the most fun things about this product is that I genuinely get excited about it every single time we do a webinar and we yeah. share with it, which we've done a lot. <laughs> we've done a lot of yeah. webinars. Who lines up these webinars for you, Luke? Yeah, Luke is doing most of them. Yeah. Okay. Lining up most of them. Good. That's a good... And, well... Are you wanting to get a, when you say we do a lot, are you wanting to get out of it? You want, you want to be not the guy that has to do the webinars? I really enjoy it. Okay. It's so really you, fun. you don't mind I being mean, the face. Yeah, I, I don't. And when do you do the webinar in that little house? No, we don't do them in the house. <laughs> oh, that's right. You go to your dad's <laughs> house. <laughs> uh, that would be too much. Could, Could be entertaining. <laughs> You're my kids crying that's in the background. Like once Rebecca and I had the. I accidentally went live on Instagram in my back pocket at bedtime. Oh, no. It's a good thing we didn't lose our Christianity. <laughs> oh, we no. sort of did. There was yelling. Oh, no. There was yelling. Oh, no. <laughs> Where's the flash? You, you got to uh, imagine that. with little Because we, we were in your stage with the little, little kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weeping and gnashing of teeth sometimes, bedtime. Yeah. So imagine going live on Instagram. In oh, the back 100%. Pocket, not knowing it. Yeah, and then all of a sudden our landline's ringing and calling, and we're like, we're ignoring it because we're putting kids to bed, and they're like, that keeps happening. Let's what's going on. Friends are reaching out. You know your life. <laughs> we and Bo said, help. "Tell Rebecca, I hope she found the floss." <laughs> oh, oh no! Oh, what a nightmare! Yeah, something they, you look back they on said, and hey, laugh that makes at, you just more but real. at the same time, <laughs> at the at the time it's happening, you're like, oh man. No, I think this is the first time I've been bold enough to mention that. Yeah. That that happened. <laughs> been, been, uh, kept, swept that one under the rug for a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you're doing those webinars and you're the face. Okay. So, and you don't mind being the face. You're a young guy. 33. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily perceive see myself doing webinars for, for the perpetuity of seed time. Yeah. You know, seed time is I mean, we'll, we'll see where it goes, you know. It it may there's there's a lot of room for growth uh with it and you know, our vision is to help as many people as possible grow their own food, you know, yeah. tying back to what we were talking about with yeah. health and all that. Okay. Um and so, you know, will I always be the 
the face on the webinars or see time? Maybe not. Um, That's one of the advantages. It is something that I enjoy. If you've grown mostly organic like I have, it's gonna it's gonna be harder to transition to Mm -hmm. not the face. Mm -hmm. Dave Ramsey's going through that right now. You know, he's wanting to retire, and you can see him bringing on co-hosts. Oh yeah, yeah. And trying to switch it over. And yeah, from what I could tell, it seems like he's doing a really good job. Yeah. Yeah, Whereas like Zig Ziglar didn't do such a great job. I mean, when he died, it's pretty much the the company's pretty much gone it seems like and i think one of the really smart thing that he's doing is his co-hosts have their own podcasts okay that are building followings yeah like just for that uh just for that co-host right so like dr john deloney he's got people that just listen to the dr john deloney show and they may not be the same ones that have listened to the yeah that's the way to to do dave ramsey well it goes back to your concept of making your staff entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. having them be an entrepreneurs yeah. That's how you're going to get them a sense of ownership. How do you get them to get have a sense of ownership, but you can still be the ultimate shot caller? Yeah. So uh, Seed Time is a private company, obviously. Um, Luke has Luke has the commission, um, so he yeah. gets he gets commission for the you know his networking and the people that yeah. he brings into his mm-hmm. network. So that obviously is one aspect. But we have a vision, and it's something that we are currently figuring out right now yeah when we are we're learning obviously like this is our first time to scale a business um but we have a vision of creating an environment that has that own that that ownership and that in some way somehow the entire team um gets rewarded as the company's profits increase and as you know so everyone is working towards the same goal because whether i'm working customer service or whether i'm uh, working marketing, um, I see. I have a I have skin in the game. Not necessarily that they'll own part of the company, but I have skin okay. in the game. That hey, if we can get our revenue or our profit or our, whatever our goal is up to X, you know, we're all going to make yeah. X bonuses, or we'll do some type of profit share or something That's good. that would that would bring the whole team into an entrepreneurial mindset versus just a employee mindset. Does it create a tension when they may have an idea to do a certain thing to grow the company or to do right because they have a stake in it as far as, you know, a commission or something, but you have to shoot it down. You have to shoot that idea down for some reason. Yeah. Do you ever see any friction there or is this just a fear I have that it's not going to be realistic? I guess we'll find out. Yeah, it hasn't <laughs> I, uh, yet. I mean, well, I would say. So, 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 if you had a marketer that wanted to market, ha, ha, had a certain idea of, oh, let's reach people on Facebook in this way, go into these, join these groups, and 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 reach out to these people, and you just for some, you whatever reason you mm-hmm. you didn't want to go there, and you didn't want to, and you had to say no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That could be demoralizing if somebody thought this is a grand idea to, to get them a big check. Yeah, and I, I would say that it hasn't like not happened um, in the sense that um, you know we are a um, you know we're primarily just focused on crops mm-hmm. right now, and so it has been a conversation in our company already. Yeah, being plant based ourselves, but yep. reaching homesteaders, you know. Um, and, and Luke is on our team and he's not, he's not plant-based. And so, you know, he, he wants to put his chickens in seed time and he can, you know, you can, you can, you can put animals and stuff in there. Um, but it's been a conversation like, you know, do we build, do we build animals into the system or do we just provide a system where people can add them in if they're interested in it? Right. And so we have chosen as a company so far to just focus on crops. Yeah. And if people want to add animals in, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to keep you from doing that. Like that's your, that's your free choice. And you can, you can, yeah. you can add those in. Um, but it's not something that we currently promote. Yeah. And that so, would be a good example. And yeah. so that's a, that's a good example if, because it is, it would, it is somewhere where, you know, we can have disagreements in the, in the context of our team. Um, 
And at the end of the day, sometimes we do, you know, as the owner of the business, I do have to, Mm -hmm. you know, my dad, myself, we're co-founders, the two of us. So we are partnered and, um, you know, we have to make a final decision of whether we go down that certain route or whatever. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, communication and understanding, like passing on our vision, even though it may not be what our employees want to do, Mm. but clearly communicating why we've decided what we've decided. And, um, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, either, either it will build respect, mutual respect because now we both understand each other and there's, there's at least there's an understanding. It's not just like, boom, we're not going to do that. And no, I'm not going to tell you why. Like, um, at least there can be some understanding or you can try and have some understanding there. But I could see potentiality at some point, you know, m- maybe it would be a situation where at some point yeah. someone wanted to do something and we said no and it became a big thing. And yeah, would you have to part ways? Maybe. I don't know. So in that case, I think, yeah, when you started talking about that and when we were on our webinar, people were asking, is this going to come for homesteading? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it could be this whole permaculture design thing. But then, then now talking to with you and knowing your passion for health and, and for you translating that into plants, yeah, I could see how you would only want to take that so far. And so that would help you with an, empl- an empl- employee coming in knowing that. So it's good mm-hmm. that you have a set of morals, boundaries that are going to be clear. So mm-hmm. somebody coming in is going to know you're only going to want to go so far with that. Yeah. Yeah. And Which is just, really fun and interesting having this conversation with you because you've done the whole carnivore diet, yeah. right? Where you were just eating. Are you still doing that like only meat or you do both? Uh, meat and it's vast majority. Is vast majority. Meat. Yeah. Uh, very few other things. Some low carb fruits and then some chocolate, dark chocolate. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. Probably less, I would say it's extremely low carb, and so less than 40 carbs a day. Yeah, yeah. More like 20. Yeah, yeah, just interesting. two meals a day, just one meal a day mostly. Okay, yeah, yeah. The, the intermittent fasting. Yeah. That can have huge, huge health benefits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because we, we do envision seed time being a homestead tool, like not mm-hmm. just not just the crops, but your beekeeping. Like one of the things we're planning to build this year is custom tasks and workflows where you can create an entire workflow for whatever you want. And it could literally include anything. And so because we come at it from the health perspective that we do, but also because we do not, um, you know, we don't come at it from a perspective of like, um, we think that animal husbandry should be outlawed. Like, I mean, we, we even are interested in including animals in our own regenerative growing, right? Even though we don't eat them necessarily, but we want to include that in the system because we think, we believe that's part of the system that God made, right? That works together. Well, you'd want the manure. You want the manure and you want... trying to think what you could get for the manure. Mm -hmm. But with all of that, um, you know, we're perfectly comfortable, at least at this point in our conversations as as a team saying, hey, we can have help documents that say, hey, you know, we, we are, we're plant-based. We, you know, for these reasons, we promote a plant-based diet. However, we recognize not everybody does that. And if you do want to add animals, like here's how you can, you could add your chickens or add your, um, yeah. you know, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm going to uh, say that Folks have heard a lot about seed time here. I'm encouraging them to just get in there and try it. I'm going to leave the link for that down in the show notes. Yeah. Um, you got any tips for them as, do you have tips for them or ways they can explore it for themselves for the first time? Yeah. So the easiest thing is to, number one, go get your free account. Um, okay. Seed time has a free level that one of our core values and part of, you know, reaching as many people as possible is creating a level of seed time where literally anyone can jump in and get started growing their own food. So at the free level, you can grow any plan, any of the built-in crops and varieties that are in seed time. 
Um, and then there's options to upgrade. Oh. So, you know, the easiest thing to do is just number one, go grab your free seat time account. Yeah. There's an, uh, there's a series of onboarding videos. Um, there are short videos that walk okay. you through how to use the calendar, the task list, the journal. Um, and then they, uh, go into a little bit of the future of seed time. And, um, so, you know, go through the onboarding series. Um, there's options to upgrade if you want to upgrade. Um, but, jump in at the free level and there's a lot that you can do to really understand the platform. And then you can even go over to our help documents, which is down right next to their profile link in the menu. There's a link to the help documents and we have uh, at the top of them a series of, we call them quick start video guides uh, that again, just go into a little bit more depth okay. and detail. And you go through those and you'll have the, the foundation to okay. use each time. Yeah. Okay, you heard it folks. So I'll leave the link for that. Free, free trial down below. Yeah. Right. Well, it's Thanks, not even. Paul. It's not even a fr like the free level isn't even, not a, even free free trial. a free trial. It's, it's like, not even like you have to no, give your credit card. It's just yeah. your free forever. Okay. No credit right. card required. All right. Go grab your free account. Yeah. Okay.